Hello, and welcome back to the Third Dimension Blog Podcast, where we look back at the history of aviation, as well as touch on other subjects from time to time that are of special importance to us as aviators. My name is Robert Novell, and this week's quote comes to us courtesy of Anne Mara Lindbergh from her book, North to the Orient. One could sit still and look at life from the air. That was it. And I was conscious again of the fundamental magic of flying, a miracle that has nothing to do with any of its practical purposes, speed, accessibility, and convenience, and will not change as they change. Looking down from the air that morning, I felt that stillness rested like a light over the earth. What motion there was took on a slow grace, like slow motion pictures which catch the moment of outstretched beauty that no one can see in life itself, so swiftly does it move. And if flying, like a glass bottom bucket, can give you that vision, that seeing eye which peers down to the still world below the choppy waves, it will always remain magic. As a wordsmith who is still learning his trade, I respect and admire the words of the Lindberghs and hope their words have special meaning for you as well. Now, let's talk about deregulation. The first question we should ask is why was deregulation necessary after 52 years of control by the U.S. government? Did they suddenly have an attack of conscience? I don't think so. It was all about the regional airlines like Texas International, Southwest, Air Cal, and others who were not being regulated by the CAB and as a consequence, they offered better fares, better frequency. The trunk carriers were not allowed to do this. So some in Congress started asking why, and before long, someone started waving the banner for deregulation. That someone was Senator Ted Kennedy. Deregulation actually came to the forefront during President Gerald Ford's stay in the White House, but it was President Jimmy Carter who made it all happen during his administration. President Carter gave the chairman's chair at the CAB to a believer in deregulation, Mr. Alfred Kahn. However, before we talk about Mr. Kahn, let's go back and talk about Senator Ted Kennedy. Senator Kennedy was convinced that government regulation did not serve a purpose and was counterproductive to the health of the airlines and the flying public. Granted, almost everyone could see that, but the senator started his process in 1974, and I find it curious that after sitting in the Senate since 1962, why it took him and others 12 years to figure this out. The interstate carriers had been around since the mid-60s, and the CAB, of course, had been micromanaging airline affairs since 1938. Senator Kennedy joined hands with Stephen Breyer, a Harvard academic, to investigate inefficiencies of existing regulations, and the Kennedy hearings focused on the inefficiencies that resulted from regulation by comparing the experience of the regulated airlines with that of the unregulated interstate carriers. Of course, their conclusions were obvious to most in the industry, but what is is most important is to understand that the dismantling of the trunk carriers began here. So Senator Kennedy pointed it out by pointing to all of the inefficiencies which his current and former colleagues had put into the system, and Mr. Kahn finished it. Senator Kennedy was a hero and a champion of the people, but I think someone forgot to consider the 20 carriers that fell from the ranks and all of the professionals who worked for those carriers who lost their jobs, their retirement, and pension funds, and their future working in an industry that they had made the best in the world. Now, back to Mr. Kahn, who is now known as the father of deregulation, an economist who also served as an advisor to President Carter, as well as the inflation czar. Now, I don't want to show my bias towards Carter. I am a diehard libertarian, but history does not treat him well or his policies kindly. However, some historians have overlooked the failure of deregulation. Mr. Kahn was a staunch supporter of deregulation, and he did his job well. The experts will tell you that fares came down 30% in the years following deregulation. You had more options, and you had better service. But what about the chaos they created and then ignored? An interesting footnote here is that 
All of the trunk airlines and their unions oppose deregulation except United. Why? Also, I found it interesting that Ralph Nader also opposed deregulation. Now, for those who think that the size and experience of the legacy carriers should have been sufficient to win this battle, you are wrong. The micromanaging of the trunk carriers by the CAB created an airline business model that was inefficient, top-heavy with management, and union contracts that were negotiated when each carrier had protected turf. Things changed quickly, and when the cash reserves and access to credit dried up, the inevitable occurred. The legacy carriers obviously had a fair war on their hands with all the new competition entering the marketplace, but they also had a very important tool in their arsenal their computerized reservation system. The airlines began to use all of the data on who flew where, what days they flew, what time they flew, and how often. The use of this data was formally titled Yield Management Pricing. American Airlines pioneered this tactic and in doing so allowed most of the legacy carriers to follow their marketing and pricing scheme and really put the business traveler at a disadvantage. Essentially, this new tactic allowed each carrier to sell different seats on the same flight for dramatic differences. Tourists who booked early could fly cheaply. Business travelers who flew at the last minute paid full fare. This obviously created a public relations problem for the carriers with the business community, so to solve that problem, the frequent flyer program became a substitute for lower prices. This perception of something for nothing worked for a while, but cost-conscious corporations soon demanded better since they were paying for the new frequent flyer program. The two-tier pay scale was the next move by the legacy carriers, and this tactic allowed the legacy carriers to pay new employees the same lower wages that the upstarts were paying. The two-tier system granted parity at some point, but the real question was whether or not the carrier would survive long enough for the new hire to recover the losses incurred. Some did, but others were not so lucky. There were other tactics employed by the legacy carriers such as hub and spoke system, the addition of the regional carriers to control fee traffic to the hubs at a substantially lower cost, and the updating of the fleets to more fuel efficient airplanes. The legacy carriers worked hard to recover from 52 years of regulation, but for many that was an impossible task. Next week we'll continue our look back, but for now I want to say thanks for stopping by. And I look forward to being with you again next week when once again we will talk about the history of our profession. Until then, take care, fly safe, and remember, all aviators are gatekeepers. Protect yourself, protect your profession, and protect the interest of all who will follow in your footsteps.